Well, hello everyone. Welcome to uh, Satellite 664. This is an Iron Maiden podcast where we discuss all things Iron Maiden. And this is our first first episode, the Maiden episode as it were. And I'm joined by a very special guest, uh, Mr. Steve Loopy Newhouse. Welcome, Steve. Afternoon, everybody. Afternoon. It's afternoon here. Well, it's, <laughs> How are you? Yeah, well, it's, it was almost midnight here in uh, Melbourne, Australia. So we've got a nine-hour time difference here. Oh, yeah, look, thanks for thanks okay. for joining us, Steve. Um, let's start off by, um, could you tell the listeners a little little bit about yourself, mate? And how you fit into the Iron Maiden um, story, and where you came from. A bit about myself. Uh, right, basically, I was I was born in uh, in East London, a crappy place called Hackney. Uh, spent most of my life living in in and around that area, um, sort of Hackney, Leytonstone, Walthamstow. Um, went to uh, went to several schools, and ended up going to a school with. Uh, Paul Andrews, who you now know, is Paul Diano. Yeah. Um, he was in a, even a year younger than me. Steve Harris was in a year older than me. I never actually got to meet Steve until after we left school. Um, as to how I sort of fitted into all this, um, it's very, very simple. Basically, when, when Paul passed the audition, uh, he was going back and forth to the studio in Bow on his own, and he was getting tired of it. So he asked me to go along with him, and I, I, that was it. I went along, and I stayed. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very, very simple. Yeah. Being a Hackney boy, um, did you know Adrian Smith back in the day? No, no, no. I, I, I was born in Hackney, but my, my folks were actually living in uh, Walthamstow at the time. So I was born in Hackney, but moved. Oh, to, okay. Uh, I basically grew up. Yeah. yeah. And um, how did you later on connect with with Maiden and become involved with them on a professional level? As I said, um, I, I sort of went along to like, basically keep Paul company. Um, and it, it got to the point where I was going, every time Paul went, I went with him. They were rehearsing, so it was a, probably a Wednesday and a Sunday afternoon. And I'd go along, I'd help them get the gear into the studio because it, Scar Studios was, was up uh, like sort of two small flights of stairs to get into like the studio level, and uh, I would um, I would give the guys a hand, you know, getting the stuff out of the back of the cars, up the stairs into the studios. I let them set it up because they knew what they were doing. I was still learning, but um, when it came, they finished. It was time to get the stuff back down, and then we'd make our way home, Excellent. and that's how I stayed. Um, as you said, on a on a personal level, but it's because I was always there. I became the, the, the sort of one and only crew member at the time. <laughs> so you you essentially were the pioneering member of the killer crew. I, I was the killer crew all on my own. <laughs> <laughs> so you you huddled into the green the green goddess as the uh, the one and only member of the killer crew. Well, no. I mean, the thing is, I, I don't drive. I, I didn't drive, and I don't still don't drive now. Um, yeah. A lot of the driving was actually done by Pete and Vic, who joined me probably about about six months later, maybe. Yeah. So, Steve, it, by the way, um, I only met you last August at the Cart and Horses, but you, I knew about you for many, many years. Anybody is into the band um, and knows the early days, knows knows the. You as Loopy. C- could you tell us how you came up with that nickname, Loopy? That's actually easy to explain. It needs to write down. I, mean, I, I wrote about this in the book, and I don't know whether it actually came across properly or not. But there was a guy, um, a guy called Trevor Sell. Now, uh, Paul was in a band called Rock Candy before he joined Maiden. And uh, Trevor was a friend of Rock Candy, but he also knew the guys from Iron Maiden. And uh, when... Paul got uh, introduced to Steve Harris at a pub in Leytonstone called Red Lion. Uh, Trevor was the guy that introduced Paul to Steve, and we were all at the uh, we were all at rehearsal one afternoon, and something something happens or something 
and said, and I've, I've responded. And um, everybody sort of went, huh? what's he talking about? And Trevor just turned around and he went, oh, don't worry about him, he's loopy. And it stuck. <laughs> That's yeah, I, got, I got called loopy from there on. That's great. It's, yeah, it's just one of those... Just one of those stupid situations, you know. As I said, he, he, said, he just said, no, "Don't worry about him; he's loopy," and, and he's stuck. And it's stuck. That's a good segue into, I guess, what I want to discuss next. Now, you've got a book out at the moment, uh, a wonderful yes, book sir. out at the moment called uh, "Loopy World," which we'll uh, we'll show the listeners here. So, um, this book was released uh, last year, was it, Steve? Uh, three years ago now. Oh, three years ago. My my bad. Yeah. My bad. So I, yeah. I, I actually uh, bought this exact copy off you um, at the Carton Horses last August. So it's uh, that's quite a special book. Now, what um, what made you or led you to writing this book? I was uh, I was chatting, uh, but I got on the Facebook. Obviously, I, uh, like people started to find me. Uh, I was finding old friends, but a lot more people were finding me. And one of the guys that got in touch with me was a guy called Steve Goldby. He runs Metal Talk, which is an online heavy metal magazine. And he said, um, he said, I've had an idea. He said, like, do you fancy writing a column for us? And I went, not really thought about it, but yeah, I'll give it a go. And um, the column became so successful I was then approached by a guy called Tony Pilman, who runs a heavy metal um, uh, music label in Belgium. And he said, well, look, so you've done the column. Do you fancy turning that into a book? And up to that point, I'd, uh, I'd done everything from memory. Everything on the column was done by, by, by memory, however bad it is. Um, and I, I said to Tony, well, look, uh, I've done the column. I don't see how I can add much more to that, but I'll give it a go. Um, anyway, about a week later, we were having a bit of a bit of a clear out at home, having a bit of a tidy up. And I happened to come across a box that had all my old diaries in. Wow. Okay, so now I've got information. So look, if, if, if you read the difference between the columns and how I actually wrote them, you now read the book chronologically. It is spot on. It's perfect. Mm. It was a- actually how things happen. When you go back to the columns and you read like part one, part two. Part two is probably part five. Part three is probably part two. It, it's it's all over the place. But uh, yeah, the, the book is now the right way round. <laughs> and anyway, going back to the, the the story behind it, um, Tony, me and Tony couldn't see eye to eye on how um, we wanted to produce the book. He wanted to do it as uh, to make it look like, make the cover look like a seven inch single. And I'm thinking to myself, if that's not what I've got in mind. Uh, if you think about the amount of pictures huh. in the loopy world, you try to put all those those pictures into a book that's seven inch square. You, you, you know, you, you're talking about a book that's going to be a mile thick. So it, it was like, it just wasn't going to work. So that all fell apart. But at the same time, I was uh, talking to Kim Darville, that's Derek Riggs' wife, and we were very, very friendly. And um, she said, well, I know somebody that, that might be interested, because this guy, um, uh, I'm not going to say his name because he tends to shy away from it all, um, but he did, uh, or he financed Derek Riggs' run for cover. So Kim approached him and said, yeah, would, would you be interested in financing um, Steve's book. And um, he got in touch with me and we started chatting and it probably took about a year to actually get the whole thing sorted. But um, in the end, I ended up with three and a half thousand copies. We've all sent here and uh, they're actually printed in the UK. Um, And yeah, they were sent here and I've still got 1,500 copies of blocking up a huge space in the hall. <laughs> wow. Look, it's it's a very, um, it's a fantastic book. It's a very unique book, and it's very different to a lot of the Iron Maiden books out there. Um, so most of the Maiden books that most fans are familiar with are more a documentary evidence, or sorry, a documentary account 
or a summary of what went down over the years. Yours is very unique because, as we said before, it's written in diary form. Yeah, it's diary form. And it's very much a blow-by-blow account of what happened in those really early years. And it's unique because it's really from your recollections, well, not really recollections, what you wrote at that time. Um, And it covers a lot of the detail and minutia that some of the other books may miss, um, which is why I I think it's a wonderful book. Now, did... um, so this is a Derek Riggs publication. So this is a Derek, Derek Riggs illus, illustration, is it not? Yes, he designed that specifically for the book. He he designed the whole cover. Fantastic, fantastic. It, he went like, down, down to the fly and the coffee stain and the, he, he did the whole thing. Um, he even used it. If you look at the picture on, oh. of me on the back, he actually made it, he bent it up so it makes it look like he's been folded about all over the place. And he, you know, I mean, he designed the whole cover. Well, look, let's let's launch into the book really and um, discuss some some of the more. Before sa- we go there, Kate. Yes, sir. Before we go there, just one other thing about the cover. For some reason, I don't know why, but if you look at the lettering, it's done in what they call Comic Sans fonts. Yep. And that has caused no end of problem. There are people that will not buy the book because it's Comic Sans. Can I just make a point of saying? that Derek Rigg designed that book, that had nothing to do with me. Read what's inside the story. Don't worry about the Comic Sans font on the front. It means nothing. Well, look, thanks for clarifying that. I think it's important to yeah. to establish that now. So, well, let's talk about some of the real fun, interesting stuff um, in the book. Take us back to the legendary Ruskin Arms in 1979. I mean, there's so much folklore about that period of the band uh, and the band's evolution and really Iron Maid now have a multi-generational fan base and a very 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 small number of those fans were lucky enough to experience that those <coughs> those early years of 79 80 take us back to Ruskin Arms what was the dynamic like what was it like being there um, I didn't set a very good example the first time we played there. Um, I managed to get completely pissed. <laughs> and um, Steve, I mean, after the show, I was sitting on the steps, um, basically there's like, a, like an entrance hall down the side of the pub that took you into the venue itself. <laughs> and um, I was sitting on the steps at the end of it. And after the gig, Steve came out and he looked at me and he went, you're supposed to be in charge of the crew. So we can't have you getting pissed every night. And I went, no, fair enough. And I, I learnt my lesson. It was something that I, I didn't do ever again. I might have had a drink or two, but I didn't get as actually hammered as I did the first night. <clears throat> so, I mean, the first night, um, I actually wrote in my diary about it, about the amount of people that turned up. But obviously, like, a lot of these names are not going to mean any, anything to anybody. But I actually made a list of all the names, that considering how drunk I was. I still remember them. <laughs> But um, um, by by the time we actually got to doing that first Ruskin Arm, Arms gig, uh, obviously like we'd added uh, Vic, Vic was doing the sound, uh, Pete Bryant was doing guitars, and I was doing the drums looking after Dougie, and um, and then you got Dave Lights had his own lighting rig, which was something that had never been been seen at the Ruskin to actually like be able to go in there put on a whole show it was always going to be that way you know, that's that's how we wanted to do it and uh, david um he'd come up with this uh, this huge board it was I don't know, about, about five feet across by three feet deep <coughs> and he had the, the lettering iron maiden done in um, mirror tile so uh, and, like with the same logo as well um and he uh, he had a, a kabuki mask fitted on the side uh, he put light bulbs all the way around the edges I mean, it was like 32 light bulbs in, in total and um, this kabuki mask was fitted to a, a, a pump that he actually stole out of his mum's fish tank <laughs> that's great <laughs> um, 
but that actually the, the mask actually spat out blood and uh, the first night um, having not tested it properly the first night it spat out so much that Doug's drum kit was completely covered because this thing was literally just behind Doug's head Doug was covered the kit was covered and it, I mean, it, thinking about it just makes me laugh but after that it um, it, it did get better but it, it, that was part of the show you know from then on they're like ed, having the eddy because that, that, that's where they came from uh, I mean the, the actual uh, name behind Eddie started as a joke mm. uh, about this kid who um, kid's born but it's just the head no body no arms no legs just the head and it comes to his 10th birthday and his mum and dad said to him Eddie it's your 10th birthday and we've got you a big surprise and he went not another fucking act <laughs> that, that's where that's where the Eddie story came from and that, that's how Eddie became Eddie it was because of a joke Steve, and, is, uh, is that a is that an East End joke? Is that a joke um, specific to the East End of London? Or was it a local no, joke? But, um, I don't know where I first heard that. Yeah, it's probably an East End joke. I mean, <laughs> it's typical the, the sense of humour of East London. So yeah, mm. yeah, probably. And um. In the book, you make mention of the impression that the band's energy and vibe made onto the audience. I mean, there was even your 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 parents actually um, attended a couple of those shows and 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 picked up on what was happening. Just how uh, how this band yeah, was used, on the I verge. To, I used to come down. I mean, they used to talk about how um, he'd, he'd never heard anybody make a guitar talk before. Oh. I was talking about talking about Dave, um, and there was one occasion uh, where um, my mum and dad turned up and they went into the small bar before they came through to see us, and they went to the bar to get a drink and the barman turned around and said, um, no, "No disrespect, uh, Mr. and Mrs., but, um, uh, but it's going to be really loud in here tonight. You know, are you sure you want a beer?" And as he said that, Paul came off the stage when I'd been uh, doing a, a sound check. Walked through the door, threw his arms around my mum, and she went, "Hello, darling." And the barman went, "Oh, sorry." <laughs> he actually realised then that you know they were with us, so uh, yeah. Mm. I mean, all of all of our parents used to come down, and Paul's mum used to come down and see him quite a bit. And there was many occasions when Paul would swear on stage, and his mum would be at the back going, "Oi, I heard that." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's quite quite funny when you look, look back on it all, but. Um, yeah. Did the band have any? Did the band members have any peculiar um, pre-gig rituals that? Uh, well, that... yeah. I, well, I, I do actually mention this in a book, but um, I will tell the story. It was uh, Steve. Um, he couldn't go on stage unless he had a crap. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's true. It's a true story. Even if the rest of the guys were in there, you know, in the sort of because yeah, everybody gets changed in the toilets in the pubs over here. Even if the rest of the band are in the toilet, Steve would go into the cubicle and have a huge dump like before he, he went on stage. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know whether he's still the same now. I mean, I, I'd like to think he's sort of got so used to it that his nerves have got the better of him now, but um, I don't know. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> so Doug Sampson exits the band and Clive Burr, rest in peace, comes into the band... Um, yeah. just sort of before the first album. Now, one of the enduring and constant themes in the book is your uh, quite strained working relationship with Clive. Could Was that something that um, was, was apparent from very early on when you met him or did it develop as you worked with him and as, as the working relationship matured? Um, no, when he first turned up, he, he was happy to have someone help set the kit up for him, you know, because I dug and left, and uh, you know, the, the guys had already turned around and said, Well, you're not going anywhere, you know, you, you work with us. Um, but no, uh, Clive, he, he was, he, he was cool, like to start with, like, really, really cool, not, not a problem at all. 
Um, we went out and did um, went out and did a couple of tours. Um, we actually did a, a very small tour, um, and then went into the studio to do the first album. And um, every, everything was fine. It's, um, it wasn't until we actually got round to doing, um, I think it was the Metal for Mothers tour with Praying Mantis supporting. Um, and that would have been, uh, that would have been around about 80? May, June. Yeah, yeah, uh, 1980. <coughs> um, he took a bit of a shine to um, to a guy called Pete Bennett, who was, uh, he looked after Dave Potts, the drum ro- a drummer for Praying Mantis. Mm. And um, this all of a sudden, uh, Clive started finding problems with the kit. Um, um, and basically, the, the way the drum kit was set up, it, there, there couldn't be, it couldn't be out of place. You got uh, like Jubilee clips around each, all of the cymbal stands. Um, you had locking pins all around the stands. Uh, everything was colour coded, so it's not like the stands were in the wrong places. Everything was marked on the floor, so it always went in the same place. We actually had uh, metal plates uh, screwed into the floor of the drum riser, so that that kit what well, couldn't go anywhere. There's no way you could go anywhere. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, what was happening was that he was turning up to do sound check, and he'd sit down at the kit and he'd go, "Well, no, that symbol's wrong. Uh, that symbol's wrong. That tom tom's in the wrong place." And a little while up, I mean, this this carried on every night, and I was getting really, really pissed off of it. I'm thinking to myself, yo, what is it that I'm doing wrong? And it turns out I was doing nothing wrong. He was moving these things about because once he actually like, he decided, yeah, I'm how I'm happy with this. I'd leave the kit as it was. He'd go off, he'd get changed. Small band would play. We clear the stage for for Maiden, and he would come on. And he'd sit behind the kit and they'd go round it and start playing the first few songs and then he'd move that back to where it was and he'd move that back to where it was and then the cymbal and the tom-tom back to where it was. And it would end up back in exactly the same position as I had set it up. And this was day in, day out. And in the book I actually said, you know, um, I mentioned about, you know, I wasn't sure whether this had something to do with MS. Mm. Uh, I, I had no idea, but then I, I met up with uh, Clive's wife, Mimi, after Clive had died, and uh, uh, bless him, he can't defend himself. And I said to, said to Mimi, look, um, when did Clive first develop MS? And she said, well, it was only about five, six years before he died. He started dropping things, and that's when he went to the doctors and was diagnosed. You know, obviously, I, they did all the tests, and it took a little while. But um, so I'm thinking, well, maybe that had nothing to do with MS, like it was with the band being you know, a bit weird and whatever. But um, I, I, I just don't know. I just don't know. Well, yeah, I mean, MS is a multiple sclerosis, is a neurodegenerative type disorder, and um, it can. I suppose evolve, uh, you know, over years before it declares itself. And one thing you did mention in the book, which was really actually quite, uh, quite shocking, is Clive at one point had to have you on stage next to him, telling him about time changes yeah, yeah. and when to come in. Did you tell us a, bit, a little bit about that. It was on the. Uh... Uh, it was about halfway through the tour. He started. Um, he would look at me. Um, to sort of like, sort of just give him a nod to let him know that like, the next time change was coming up. And it was only on the longer songs. Uh, so that's stuff like um, Murders in a Room Org or... or um, Phantom, Phantom of the Opera. Opera. Yeah. Yeah. You know, th- things like that. Or oh, Killers, I think mean, there was a time change in there that he was a bit unsure of. But it was only sort of two or three songs at the most. The rest, he had, had no problem with. Um, but yeah, if you, if, he would look at me and basically rely on me to sort of give him the nod. Uh, just so, right, that, that's coming up. And was it a situation where previously he had no problem at all with those songs, but all of a sudden he did? 
but he had no problems in the studio when he recorded the tracks. Mm. No problems at all. So this is something, again, that was sort of developing over the length of time. I mean, to be perfectly honest, uh, the guy that took over from me, I, uh, Colin, I have no idea what he went through with Clive. From what I understand, he got on with Clive really well. Now, whether Colin had to learn these time changes as well, who knows? Mm. It, 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 you know, the most amazing songs are pretty straightforward. You get used to it after a, you hear it two or three or four times, and yeah, mm. you know, maybe uh, maybe Clive got better. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> That's fascinating, Steve. Let's fast forward to uh, August 1980, and Maiden scored their first ever big tour, big scale, large scale international tour, supporting Kiss. Um, yeah. Now, they're two very different bands. I mean, at that time, Kiss was very much gone into the pop disco vibe. They had these big, elaborate, sort of, you know, Vegas type costumes, whereas Maiden were the polar opposite. They were black leather studs, you know, quite, you know, hard hitting music. Were you surprised at the, the, the pair up between those two bands? Yeah, I'd love to know how Rod got that got that tour. I'd love to know. It's uh, I mean, it was great for us to sort of get out and, and do something in Europe. We, I think we'd only been to Europe once before, and uh, got that completely wrong. We um, when when you load equipment onto a truck to take it out of the country, you have to have a thing called a carno, which it gives a complete list of every bit of equipment, serial numbers, weight. We didn't have one. We went out to do this show in, in Belgium, a place called Cortric, and um, we had no carno. Now, getting out of the country wasn't a problem, nobody checks. Coming back into the country, the customs officers wanted to know where the carno was. And um, I'd, I'd gone out in the, in the truck with the guys, but I came back in the limo with a band. And um, we, did, uh, we all went straight off to this uh, uh, club in Kingsway called the Heavy Metal Soundhouse. And um, all of a sudden, we, we get a phone call from customs at Dover. <laughs> they actually phoned up the pub um, saying that, um, uh, we, you know, we've got your people here. Uh, they've got no carne for the equipment. And even Rod was scratching his head going, carne? What carne? What's a carne? Nobody knew. <laughs> Uh, but as I said, that that all got sorted out. So we, when we went out to uh, out to do the Kiss tour, all that kind of stuff had been sorted out properly. The only thing we we didn't bank on was um, border crossings shutting when they did. Um, we were trying to get from Switzerland into Italy, and they shut the border at four four o'clock in the afternoon, and wasn't going to open again until eight o'clock the following morning. Now, so that's sixteen hours of driving that we've lost. And uh, I mean, we, we we got back on the road just after eight o'clock the following morning, and we've now got to get to Rome, which is seven hundred miles away, um, yeah, in time to get the band equipment on stage, so they could go on at around about eight thirty. And um, we got down there, and it was sort of getting close to eight o'clock, and we'd been given a, a, a list of where the hotel was. So uh, we went straight to the hotel, found somewhere to park, and we jumped in a cab and went down to the gig, down to the gig. You know, just go and apologise to the band, you know, apologise to Kiss for not, not sort of being out of set up. And we get there, and Rod, Rod meets us first, and he says, well, where's the equipment? So Michael Kenny, he went, oh, that's back at the hotel. <laughs> get back in that fucking cab and go and get it. <laughs> So that's what happened. That Michael had to go and get, get back in the cab, go back to the hotel, pick up the truck, and get a cab. Right, he had to follow a cab back to the gig, and we unloaded everything, got the band on stage, and they were actually on stage within about twenty minutes. Um, but yeah, the Kiss tour was was a, a lot of fun. It was um, we did three shows in Italy, and then Kiss were coming over to England, and by that point, made them too big to support Kiss in England. Wow. Um, you know, they, were, they were playing at places where Maiden could easily headline themselves. So um, we, we stayed in Italy for a week. But uh, by that time, it's, um, 
we sort of got used to like the, the, the way that sort of rock and roll machine worked. And Kiss, I mean, it, it, we didn't actually get to see them a great deal because once our equipment was loaded in the truck, we'd go off to the next venue. Um, so whether Rod and Steve had time to talk to any of them about, you know, how to do this, how to do that, I'm, I'm not really sure. But to be perfectly honest, I, I think Rod and Steve already had their own ideas about how they wanted to do things. And I, I think they were pretty much sort of sticking to it. It's, um, um, but all in all, I mean, you, you know, as uh, crew members, because we were getting there like before the band, we had time to chat with their crew. Um, and if we didn't learn anything, the one thing we did learn properly was how to flick a plectrum from one side of the stage to the other which you're talking about 60 or 70 feet with complete accuracy. Wow. And, and we noticed that uh, when Kiss were on stage, they'd do the same thing. If there was someone in the audience they wanted to get a plectrum to, they could flick it in mm. such a way that that person would get the get the plectrum. And it's, you know, it's, it's unique. We'd never seen anything like it. Yeah, Ace Freely. Ace Freely during uh, most of his songs would, would flick plectrums out all the time. Um, so obviously, obviously that had practice. So would did any of the members of Kiss, you know, Gene Simmons, Paul Stanley, didn't really show any interest towards Iron Maiden, or they they uh, approach? They, uh, they they loved the band, uh, but they loved the uh, the rawness, the freshness. Uh, they loved it, like the way the Maiden sort of approached. You know, it was like the, like they loved the mentality of sort of just going out there and just doing. What they, you know, what they wanted to do, and um, they had a at the end of the tour, they had a, an end of tour party that we all got invited to in uh, Norway, and uh, they were saying then, especially like Gene and Paul, uh, they, they were saying how much fun they'd had on this tour, and they really wished that you know we could go out and support them in in the US, and Steve went. Might be the other way around, mate. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, eight years later in 19, 1988, that's exactly what happened. Um, but Donington, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, right through the Monsters of Rock, um, uh, you know, through Schweinfurt and Modena, Italy. I mean, Maiden, <laughs> yeah, Maiden were headlining and Kiss were, I think, second on the bill. So it's it's interesting how things really did, did sort of come yeah. about. I was saying about the uh, end of tour party. And um, I wanted Paul Stanley to sign something. So he pulled a dollar bill out of his pocket and he, um, he drew the star over Lincoln's face. <laughs> and I, I wish I still had that. That disappeared quite a few years ago, but I wish I still had it. But that, that was his signature. For oh, me. the Kiss collectors would pay thousands. Oh, no. Thousands. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't find it. <laughs> oh, Steve, come on. Dennis Stratton, tell us about how Dennis Stratton's tenure with the band ended, because there is a crossover with the Kiss tour, isn't there, with Dennis, and the beginning of the end of his stay with it with Iron Maiden. Yeah, basically, Den, he'd been around for a long time. You know, he, he, the band he'd been in before had been out on tour in Europe with uh, Status Quo, and. He's more into sort of like the, the bluesy side of, of rock, um, and he, his uh, his personal listening taste, you know, on tour, he'd be listening to something like Steely Dan, oh. and back in those days, you know, headphones had a lot of, like a, they, they weren't sort of enclosed; they had quite a, a big sort of overspill, so you could actually hear what people were listening to. And Rod sat there listening to it, and he goes. Of course, being a blood heavy metal band, what you're listening to that crap for? And um, that, that was the kind of attitude that, that, that Rod had. To be perfectly honest, I don't think Rod was a heavy metal fan. I mean, he probably is now. He's, you know, he's, he's been in it for 40 years. But he was uh, tied in with bands like um, uh, uh, a guy called Paul Young. Went on to have like, quite a successful solo career over here. But originally, it was a band called Q-Tips. And Rod... Where he had something to do with Q-tips. Now you, you listen to Paul Young; that's even more melodic than what Dennis was listening to. 
So that just does, doesn't make any sense. But anyway, um, it got to, um, we got back off the Kiss tour and we went to um, uh, Rainbow Theatre to do a video for the, the next single, which was uh, Women in Uniform. And Dennis noticed that um, during the video shoot, the cameras were never on him for very long. You know, as soon as he sort of caught this red light on him, the red light was gone. And the red light was on the camera, I sort of focused on Dave playing, playing a solo or, or whatever, you know. Um, so Dennis decided that um, enough was enough, basically. And he went to the office and Steve just happened to be here. And Dennis went, went to the office and sat down with Rod and said, look, he said, I'm not beating, there's no point in sort of beating about the bush. He said, I want out and you want me to go. He said, so let's just call it quits and we'll leave it there. Which uh, Rod sort of went, okay. And Steve went, yeah, sorry, mate. Yeah, shame it didn't work out. Dennis left the office and within 15 seconds, Steve was on the phone to Adrian saying that place is available for you. So the thing is, also what you guys have got to understand is that uh, Dave and Adrian grew up together. They went to the same schools. They grew up playing guitars together, and that was always Dave's ideal guitar partner. Hmm. It always was. So yeah, well, yeah, it was no surprise that it happened. And in hindsight, look, it's a it, it's an incredible, it's a fabulous guitar combination that's worked. You know, oh, for my, decades. There's, isn't there's, it? there's none better. Yeah. There's none better. And, all right, you've got Yannick now as well. You yeah. know, sort of just opens up the dimension even yeah. more. You know? Oh, Yannick, yeah. Yannick is a, a fantastic guitar player and a, and a performer as well. Just getting, just finishing off with Dennis, was was there a personality difference between him and Rod, do you think, that caused those divisions? Because it's hard to imagine that that they would, you know, have something against him just because of his musical tastes. I mean... I mean, was there, something... there must have been there must have been some kind of conflict going on because Dennis actually turned around and said many a time when we did the um, um, when we did the uh, Metal for Mothers tour, yeah, the band traveling in the limousine, <clears throat> but Dennis nine times out of ten would travel on the, on the tour bus with us, <clears throat> just to have his own bit of space if you like, um, and it, it, he said that you know if, if there was room in the va in the van that we were driving. He would prefer to have come with us. Mm. You know, he said that many a time. Mm. So yeah, there was there was obviously some kind of division, but um, mm. whether, whether it, that was with the band or whether that was with Rod or I, I don't know. So fast forward to 1981 now. You know, the great Adrian Smith is in the band. Um, they've recorded Killers with Martin Birch, and yep. you're on tour. You're on tour in um, your first time in Japan. Uh, Japan 81 tell us about Mr. Udo and how he used to run tour, the touring or, or more or less their touring protocol oh yeah well, one, one thing you do notice about uh, the Japanese style of doing things is whereas in this country we have uh, we we go out on a tour of, uh, uh, it's, let's try and get this right. Um, we have a fleet of trucks. You might call them, well, you've got your big 18 wheelers, wheelers out there. You know. We well, call them Artics. It's basically, there's a truck and a, a tractor unit. They're all about 40, 45 feet long. And in the UK, our last tour, well, that, the tour we did in uh, Europe and the UK prior to Japan, we had two of these huge trailers and they were stacked on the rafters. You know, you know you've got lights and PA and backline all in one. It, was, it just filled it out. And um, when we got to Japan, all the equipment went into a fleet of very, very small vans. Um, a lot of box vans, probably about 10 feet long. I mean, they were, they were tiny, but it was a must have been about 50 of them. <laughs> but um, what uh, 
one thing that became obvious like when we got out there is uh, the first show. Um, they let us set up the way we wanted it. Basically, Dave Lights had already forwarded um, like what he wanted lighting rig wise. <clears throat> and it was very, very straightforward. You know, there's a back truss with a couple of extra bits sort of hanging off and then just a plain front truss. Um, and then what he would do is he would stand on the floor and say, right, I want that one facing at me. That was done. Right, next one facing at me. And then he'd, he'd move and go, right, the next one I want facing me there. And he'd, he'd, he would move about. And what they were doing, the Japanese were sitting there with notepads, just writing everything down. Absolutely everything. And you got one guy following Dave around with his notepad and making notes and like exactly where those light beams went. <coughs> um, Dougie had his PA to sort out. So basically, the PA was set up and they make a note. Yeah, okay, so you've got four sub bases there and you've got two mid bases there and two tweaks on the top. Yeah, no problem. Um, then the back line got set up. And again, you've got someone walking around going, yeah, we've got your two four by 12s there. Uh, the 12s there, drum riser, nine foot by eight in the centre. Yeah, okay, no problem. I'd set the drum kit up and the guy was going, okay. So he put a little pen mark there and a little pen mark there. Yeah, no problem. And he'd make a note and then all the symbols went up and there's like the tom toms. And um, he, uh, this guy again, sort of made a note of everything. When we turned up at the next gig, that was in Tokyo, the next gig we, we went down to. Uh, I think it was Nagoya. Yeah, I think it was Nagoya, and then we did Osaka, and then came back to Tokyo for the final two shows. When we arrived at Nagoya, uh, we had to be there at, uh, well, we didn't have to be there that early, but we got a bullet train out of Tokyo at five o'clock in the morning, which got us down to Nagoya at eight o'clock. We went straight to the venue, so we were at the venue by quarter to nine. Everything was set up. I mean, absolutely everything. The lights were in place, the drum kit was sparkling. <laughs> It's like it's all because these guys have sat there and written everything down. It's it just like astonishing. And it was like a bloody, it was a bloody holiday for us. We went and sat down and had something to eat, and the band turned up and gone, "Blimey, you've worked hard." So yeah, yeah, well, yeah. It's, it's the way it goes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Oh, God bless Japan, eh? Um... <laughs> oh, it's, 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 what an what an adventure. One and only time there, but I'd love to go back. It's just a stunning place. So, so your expensive. expensive. So your yeah, te- your tenure with Iron Maiden ended after the Killers tour. Could you could you tell oh, us? No, basically the, the Killers tour went on. I um, after the uh, Japanese tour, we all flew to America, and some of us um, went to Seattle, and we were going to fly down to Los Angeles the following day. Uh, but the rest of the guys went straight down to, to LA and um, we stayed at a place called the Edgewater Inn in Seattle and it's known for fishing from your window and you literally can throw your, your fishing rod straight into the, into the sea outside wow. and it was a great place um, and uh, it's quite funny I mean at the time I was what 20 25. I mean, Dave was around about the same age. Uh, Adrian was there, Clive. We all went out for a drink. And uh, so we sit down, and barmaid comes over and she says, oh, What can I get you guys? We will, we will, you know, we'll have a beer. You got any ID? Uh, Dave was the only one who actually carried his passport with him, but they didn't believe that he was old enough to drink. <laughs> it was just crazy. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, so. From there, so the following day, we jumped on another flight and we went down to LA. And um, as soon as we landed, I got called into uh, the uh, our uh, production officer's uh, room, our production guy's room, and um, said that uh, like basically, you know, they don't need you anymore. You know, Colin Clayton, who'd come in to look after Adrian, um, is going to take your place. And I went, oh, great, thanks very much. And that was pretty much it. They also laid off another guy called uh, Steve Jones. He'd been the stage manager on the tour, but he um, he was more of a, a theatre guy. You know, he didn't actually know that much about rock and roll until he actually came out with us. And it was a real sort of eye-opener for him. Um, but it was a good thing he did come because we flew back on the same flight. 
and got to Gatwick, uh, and I got pulled over by customs and completely taken apart, strip search everything, and uh, it down to the point where they were unscrewing my cassettes to see if I was actually hiding anything in the, in the cassette tape. Um, and I'm thinking, shit, if Steve's gone, I've got no money, how do I get home? Anyway, he waited for me, and I said to him, look, it's a good thing you did wait, because I, I, I'm skinned, I've got no, absolutely nothing on me. So can you give me some money to get home? And he went, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he gives me a fiver, and that actually got me home. It was either that or I was going to have to call me dad up to come and pick me up from Gatwick, and he wouldn't have, wouldn't have been happy about that. But, um, yeah, so that, that was uh, that was where I finished with Maiden, but Maiden went on to like, do the, the rest of the American tour. Was um, there a reason, though, that your time finished, uh, or were they, did they just it, it, it goes back to that, that story I was saying about um, Clive um, sort of, uh, not being happy with me setting up a kit. No, this had been rumbling on and rumbling on. On the UK tour that year, uh, in, um, we were at uh, Bristol. Uh, he actually turned around and said, uh, you know, he said, right, me and you, we need to sit down and chat. So we went and found, found somewhere really nice and quiet. And the two of us just sat there and talked. And he said, you know, basically, you're really going to have to up your game. And I said, the thing is, Clive, I don't understand what I'm doing wrong. I set the kit up the way, I, way I'm supposed to do every day. You come in, change it, and then move it back. So how can that be my fault? He said, well, you're going to have to sort yourself out. Otherwise, I'm going to have to find someone else. And I went, do what you got to do. And that's obviously, well, it's just one of those things. It's, um, it, that's basically what happened. He, he got Colin Clayton in. Um, as I said, he came in to be a, to be a guitar tech and look after Adrian. But he actually had no idea about guitars whatsoever. He was letting another guy, Michael Winter, hmm. sort of guitar tech. But, so, uh, so now fast forward to 1983 to peace yeah. of mind which incidentally is when i became a fan i sort of early early 83 when i discovered the band um now you got a call you got a call to come back but it wasn't immediately <laughs> it wasn't Im- no. immediately evident why they wanted you back uh, but it, but it's cut a lot would actually go back to the start when uh, when i made we're in the in the uk in 1983, um, it was around that May time, and Keith Wilfall, who uh, used to run the fan club, um, he phoned me up. He said, "Look, it's a maiden playing down at Southampton. Do you fancy going?" Yeah, okay. So he come and picked me up, and we drove down to Southampton. Um, after the gig, um, we went back to the band's hotel, sat and had a couple of drinks, <coughs> and I got to meet a guy called Warren Poppy. Uh, Warren was the uh, Warren was the um, the band's um, uh, production assistant, and uh, I started generally helping him out, you know, picking up dirty towels, um, just, you know, that, that sort of kind of stuff, you know, giving him a hand with the drinks, getting drinks on stage. Um, he said to me, "Look, how quickly can you get home and pack a bag?" I said well, where are you next? He said, Ipswich. I said, I'll see you there. So I went home, packed a bag, and I got a friend to take me up to Ipswich. And he dropped me off at the gig. He came and saw the show, um, got to meet a couple of the members of the band, so he was happy. And then he drove home, and I stayed with the band. And they put me in a hotel in Ipswich. And basically, from then on, I travelled with the band for the rest of the UK tour. <coughs> Even to the point where um, we were in uh, Stoke, where Maiden did the Hanley, uh, uh, Victoria Hall in Hanley. And where we were staying was opposite Stoke Central Station. And they turned around and said to me, look, Bruce wants to go to uh, go to the next gig in Bristol by train. Do you want to go with him? And I went, yeah, why not? So, um, so the band drove off and me and Bruce walked across the station. And, you know, and it's actually really nice to spend a couple of hours sitting on the train with Bruce because we hadn't really spoken that much. But, you know, after a couple of hours, chatting with Bruce on the way, way to, uh, to Bristol. It was great fun. We got to the hotel and uh, I met up with him in the, in the bar afterwards. And we sat there like chatting like we were, we were old mates. It was, uh, it was really good fun. Mm. <coughs> um, anyway, it got, it got to the end of the tour and the, uh, Maiden did four shows at the, uh, at the Odeon, 
which again is uh, basically Iron Maiden shows in London is always like coming home. You know, they spend so much time out of the country. Um, that, uh, so these are the four nights at Hammersmith, right? In 83. Yeah, yeah. May 83. Yeah, yeah. yeah May 83. So at the end of the tour, I'm thinking, God, well, maybe they're going to offer me to go out and do like, the, the rest of the tour. But that didn't happen. So, okay, so I went back to doing what I was doing before, which wasn't a great deal. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd been struggling to find work, uh, but I found, uh, uh, I found work through the local stage crew company called Stage Miracles, started working for them. And um, getting towards the end of the year, I'd just come back from doing uh, Barry Manilow at um, um, a place in Oxford, I can't remember the name of the place, but a uh, big stately home. And we were there for about two weeks, sort of building the stage, putting on the show, <coughs> taking it down afterwards. I'd literally got home about two days. Uh, I've been home about two days. And Keith Wilford rings me up. I said, hello, mate, what's up? He said, uh, just give me your heads up. Uh, Tony Wiggins is going to ring you. So Tony is the tour manager. Uh, uh, cheers, mate. Thanks a lot. The uh, following night, Tony rings up. And he says, uh, Loopy, are you available for the rest of the year? I went, uh, yeah, well, what's up, mate? He said, well, look, he said, Warren needs an assistant. And there's a space agent that, uh, you, are you willing you know, to want to take it? And I went, absolutely. Uh, you know, where, where and when? And he gave me the details. And a few days later, I met him and the rest of the band at the Gore Hotel in Kensington. And we sat down and sort of talked about what I had to do. And it was, it was easy money, because it really was. I had next to nothing to do look after the dressing rooms, make sure that the dressing room cases were put into the, into the dressing rooms, make sure that um, Nico had a, a pint of cold milk when he came off stage, um, make sure that the sandwiches were, were prepared and in the dressing room when the band showed up, make sure that all the drinks were ready. It, 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 was, it was like that every day. And I had to go out doing shopping every now and again to go and pick up uh, like toiletries. If somebody ran out of deodorant, that was my job to go and replace it. Um, any laundry, I'd take laundry into the hotel, get them to process it overnight so it was ready for the following morning to be picked up, taken onto the bus for the next gig. It, it was things like that, but it was easy, easy money. Yeah. Now, as a, as a, as a schoolboy back then, um, I remember watching the, the infamous killing of Eddie in Dortmund, December 1883. <laughs> And back then, you know, as a as a as a as a much younger fan, I was um, I thought it was the, the most greatest thing I'd ever seen. But that incident almost ended in tragedy, didn't it? it well, it could have. Could you it tell could us? Have. Could you tell us what happened? What potentially could have happened? What potentially could have happened is that Sir Warren Poppy on the inside of the suit could have been seriously damaged. <laughs> Um, basically, what happened was that uh, it is, if you imagine like the Eddie seat, it's um, it's an aluminium frame um, covered basically in papier mache, um, and then there's like sort of like gauze kind of stuff on the outside of that, sort of give it that sort of hardened look. Um, and um, the top of Eddie's head used to come off, and they'd be used to be able to take his brain out. Um, but what they, they used to do was instead of putting brains in there, they used to put a bag of offal. <laughs> so a lot of cow in it, so a bag of cow in it, and pulled it out, so it's shit and <laughs> blood everywhere. <laughs> um, <coughs> anyway, on, on this particular, particular occasion, um, Bill Barkley had adopted one of uh, Murray's um, sort of cheap guitars. He had a couple of squires. <coughs> and... Um, he uh, he saw the neck halfway through, so that basically when when sort of Murray decided at the end of the set to sort of smash his guitar on, on the floor, the head would fly off and leave this sharp jagged point, and it was quite sharp. And uh, the idea was that um, once Bruce had pulled the brains out of at the top of Eddie's head, um, they were going to kill Eddie off, and. Warren had been told, right, when Dave thrusts his guitar at you, make sure you move. And I think he had to move to his right, or maybe to his left, I can't remember, because Dave was going to strike him like, with the guitar on the, on the other side. But basically, through the, through the goals, 
uh, Warren could see what was happening. And as Dave went to go like that, you know, thrust the guitar into him, Warren see it going to the wrong side, and he quickly had to move over to the other side. And this um, this guitar sort of went through. You know, it, it could have been could have been fatal. Mm. It could have been fatal. Yeah, but uh, luckily, Warren see it coming. So so anyway, Eddie ends up on the floor, and four of the crew were dressed up in uh, long white coats, who then came on, sort of grabbed the neck, arm and the luggage, and just carried Eddie off the side of the stage. And even to this day, it's probably one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. The fact that it, all, it all went horribly wrong, but still looked great. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the things you learn 36 years later, I suppose. Um, yeah. So, now that was that was a incredible festival, wasn't it? You had um, basically all the, the big hitters there. You had Ozzy, <coughs> Def Leppard, um, Michael Schenker Scorpions. Group, Scorpions. What was it like interacting with with all these guys, with all these iconic, you know, people in the metal scene? It was uh, it, was, it was quite interesting. Um, we uh, we were staying in a hotel not far from the venue, and uh, it wasn't just us. There was uh, Def Leppard were there, Ozzy Osbourne, Scorpions were there. Uh, there was a few other people sort of floating about. In Quiet Riot, I think, oh, were staying yeah. there. And um, Kaja Gugu had been there the night before on the pop side of the rock pop. And um, uh, Nick Beggs, the bass player, was still there and he was sitting down sort of chatting with all of us. Now, if you imagine, I'm, I'm sitting um, sitting facing the bar. There's a table in front of me. I've got Ozzy sitting next to me on my left. I've got Phil Collin from Def Leppard on my right. We do know each other from school. So that, that goes back you know, quite a long way. And um, there was someone sitting next to next to Colin, and then as the sofa went down towards the bar, Nick Beggs is sitting over on the side. <coughs> now getting back to Ozzy, Ozzy's personal assistant, his PA, was standing directly behind him. And every time Ozzy put his hand up, his PA, that was the cue for his PA to go and get a drink, <laughs> and he'd come back, put it in front of Ozzy, and um, a few minutes later, Ozzy's hand would go up again, and off he'd go. And this was like all night long. This was. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, Nick Beggs is, uh, was teetotal. And um, somebody said, hey, Nick, you want to have a drink? And go, yeah, I'll have an orange. So they were going up, getting him an orange, but sticking a double vodka in it. And uh, he slowly, slowly got absolutely so pissed that he ended up, he slid off his chair under the table, and that's where we left him. <laughs> we, all, we, all, <laughs> we all went off to bed. But um, I, I was chatting with um, with Phil Collin, and he's not a big drinker either. But to actually sort of see him sort of get up and stumble towards the, the corridor where his room was, and he was literally bouncing from one wall to the next. <laughs> yeah, good fun. Was yeah, good fun. funny. Phil's a fitness fanatic and a vegetarian, isn't he, now these days? Um, Is he now? God knows. Yeah. I've not actually seen Phil for about 25 years now. No, I saw, I saw Def Leppard last year and um, Phil Collin, I mean, at, at 62 years old, just very fit, very, very fit. So um, uh, I think he's, he's into his exercise and diet and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, can't blame him. <laughs> all right. Now, going... going Ford. Now we get to some some <coughs> the adventures continue. Now Power Slave, nineteen eighty four. Nassau Compass Point Studios. You were there. You were there. Yes. And um, in the book, you discuss some some <coughs> fascinating things that went on in and around the recording of Power Slave. And look, we could we could actually do a whole episode just on the recording of Power Slave, and, and maybe I'd we, we could one day, but. Just, just briefly, um, one of the things you mentioned is that Steve Harris had this daily exercise routine where he would gather everyone around and and yeah. go. For, what was it go for a, a like a three mile jog or run? It, it yeah, pretty much was about yes, maybe three, maybe a bit more. Um, the, the nearest bar to where we were staying was a place called Travellers Rest, and it was uphill, so. He would start off with his, his pace, and everybody had to sort of stick, like sort of try and stick with him. And you'll get up to the traveller's rest, and then you turn around and you start running back down, and then you do a sprint towards the end. 
And having done no exercise at all for years, <laughs> um, Steve was staying in one of the, there was like four houses all exactly the same, right on the seafront. I mean, the sea actually laps up against the, the wall underneath the, the, uh, the balcony. And um, we all got back to his place. And the first thing I did was went straight out on the balcony and threw up over the side because I was just so unfit. But um, after, uh, I think we did that pretty much every day for about, about two weeks. And you see, soon sort of got used to it. But it, it wasn't doing us any favours because... Um, at the time, and this is actually started, we were still waiting for the band's equipment to turn up. So it was a way of sort of keeping our, keeping ourselves ticking over. Um, when the band's equipment started turning up, the band were going to the studio at two o'clock in the afternoon, coming out of there around about eight, nine o'clock in the evening, and then we go and hit the bars. So we weren't getting back to back to the, the complex until sort of three, four o'clock in the morning, and then recycle. You know, just keep doing, keep doing. So the actual training routine stopped as soon as the band's equipment turned up. Oh, okay. Thank Christ. Was it, <laughs> was, it, was it something that Steve introduced to sort of prevent boredom or, or was he actually foreseeing a gruelling 13-month tour coming and he wanted to keep everyone in shape? Or was he preempting that? Uh, that I don't know. I mean, it, it was a big tour in a way, and I wish I'd been part of it, but uh, uh, that's another story. Um, oh, I don't really know if I'm, if I'm on his case. I don't really know. Yeah. It's, um, I think it, it was just a way of sort of keeping himself fit and mm. taking along at anybody that was interested. <laughs> but but so, you know, like, instead of um, sort of asking for volunteers, it's like you have volunteered. <laughs> 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 uh, that's that's fantastic. Now, th- there's one s- uh, section in the book. There's a very, very definitive statement you make where you said the Power Slave album just turned out so fantastic because of the the atmosphere and surroundings in in. Oh, right. Now, is that? Can you elaborate on that? I mean, is it what 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 was it about that environment which made the album so good? Because I mean. I remember when I when I first heard it back in '84. I mean, and to this day, to my ears, that album really does take you back to ancient Egypt. It it it, it, may as, it sounds like it was recorded in you know, the temple of <coughs> Ramesses the second. I mean, what was it about the um, the that environment at Compass Point which which you feel made the album what it is? If you can imagine, if you can imagine. Um... Uh, imagine paradise, not completely like your sandy beaches, your palm trees, coconuts falling very, very close to your head. Um, and this really nice studio complex, I mean, like sort of big glass windows on the outside. And when you actually sort of go into the studio, you go, Blimey, you know, this is a little bit special. Um, you, you turn left, you go through the main doors, you turn left towards the studio complex itself. Uh, the main studio was on the right-hand side, uh, the control room, and then behind that was the uh, the main studio. And then there was another sound booth behind that and another one behind that where they could test out different things. If you went left, there was a, a little pool room. Um, uh, next to the pool room was the kitchen, and then you got the toilets a little bit further up. And it, it's just something about that, that whole environment. Um, I mean, being able to come out of there, uh, when, when I first first landed in Nassau, um, I was given one of the properties, um, whereas me and Michael Kenny were sharing a, um, an apartment in the buildings at the back end of the complex. It was like a little sort of windy road that went up around a, a small sort of um, outdoor swimming pool with a, a, like a bridge over it um, and then you come up to these houses um, um, there was, I mean, it, living in those houses where there were guys from a band called Saga um, there was um, Chris and Tina from um, Talking Heads <clears throat> Chris Martin uh, Chris Martin John Martin yeah John Martin was, was staying there um, 
he had a bit of a Barney with his missus and he buggered off. Um, and then there was me and Michael. Now, so you're all these sort of big stars and sharing these, these apartments, and there's me and Michael sort of sharing one. It was just crazy. <laughs> and then after after a couple of weeks, um, uh, somebody somebody else came over, and uh, I got moved out and moved down to another apartment right on the beach, where I was sharing with Steve Altman, Dave Lights, uh, Dougie Hall, um, Derek Riggs. Uh, this this place was fantastic. I mean, it, it was um, I said literally right on the beach. You come come out of my my room. And there was a jetty that went out into the sea. And you could either stand there and watch the, like, the fish going past, or you get your snorkel on and you go out there and swim with them. It was just stunning. It's, you know, it's, I, th- I think that's what helped towards Power Slave being so good. Mm. That's but, incredible. Um, and, and I believe you were in the studio when they cut the tracks to the actual song Power Slave? Uh, I was outside. Uh, being uh, a production assistant, you know, I was on their sort of, I was there on their, their sort of beck and call. You know, if they wanted something, it was down to me to sort it out. <coughs> um, it was only the actual sort of, uh, personal crew that were allowed into the studio to listen to what was going on. Oh. But you could sit outside, outside and hear it anyway. Yeah. What was Derek, Derek Riggs doing in Nassau? Um, he was there, um, he was, cause they'd already decided that Ace is High was going to be the, the first single off the album. And he was there, uh, designing the artwork. Uh, I think there is a picture of it in the book. Yes, there is. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I, I took that photo wow. of his artwork, but I'll be in works on there. Um, but what he found was it was the humidity was just too much. So he ended up, um, he, he took his basic design and flew back to London and finished the artwork off there. But uh, he, he was out there with us. I mean, we were there for a, about two months. Derek was with us for about two weeks. <laughs> Had to go back home. <clears throat> well, the ironic thing is that now, you know, talking about the humidity, he now lives in California. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and- he's still working. And presumably it was decided long before recording started that it was going to be an ancient Egyptian theme. I, I had no idea at the time. Oh, um, you didn't? Basically, no, I had no idea what was going on. Um, when you think about it, Power Slave um, is the only uh, Egyptian sort of theme song on the whole album. Correct. Yeah. And the rest, you know, rest of your eyes is high, so oh. you're talking about Spitfires. Uh, you got the flash of the flash of the blade, the duelists, which is all about you know, sort of pistols. So um, I was actually quite surprised when they they, uh, they came up with the artwork or agreed to have that as the artwork because they could have gone in so many different directions. Uh, um, but one one thing I did do, there was a couple of guys um, that sort of worked in and around the studio, a couple of young lads, probably only 18, 19, but they showed me how to use. Um, a tape to tape machine. That was a recording off of a tape to tape onto a cassette. <clears throat> and I managed to get hold of the master or a copy of the master tape uh, for the entire album. And I copied it onto a cassette. But this was all without Bruce's vocals. There was oh, some wow. some on there, like some sort of slight uh, sort of, sort of um, Bruce guide vocal, if you like, but it wasn't a finished article. Um, some didn't even have guitar solos. It was just like the basics. And I, I did what I was told to do. And I wound the tape back so it looked like it hadn't been fiddled. We put it back to where I found it. <laughs> None of this is in the book. So if I ever get caught, if I ever get caught out, I'm in trouble. <laughs> and when I when I played the cassette back, I set the levels too high and it was so distorted, you couldn't hear it. <laughs> but hey... Live and learn. <laughs> Live and learn. And not long after that, you, the band and the crew relocated to Florida, was it? And your Fort Lauderdale. Fort Lauderdale. And <coughs> your your yeah. your second tenure with with Iron Maiden finished. Um, 
your third. Um, my apologies. Your third tenure Sorry. with Iron Maiden finished, and <laughs> and yeah. was that? Um, could you could you discuss the events that possibly would have been a catalyst to that? What 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 happened? Going back to uh, what I was saying just now about sort of being in the band's beck and call, he's a bit hypocritical. Now, yes, that's what I was meant to, meant to be there for. But something snapped in me. I don't know what. Um, I, I do make a point of explaining this in the book, but very briefly, uh, the band had been working on Rhyming Ancient Mariner. Now, imagine what that artwork would have looked like for an album. Great yeah, song, I'm incredible a, song. Yeah. So anyway, they, they they come out of the studio and they took took a break, and they were out there for about an hour. I was playing Paul with Dave, and um, a couple of them sort of went and made themselves a cup of tea. I mean, nobody asked me to do anything. You know, that was fine. But what annoyed me was just as they were going back in, Nico turned around and said, "Luke, you'd make us a cup of tea," <laughs> and like an idiot, like an idiot, I snapped back in and said, well, "What did your last slave die of?" What, what I was trying to get at was they'd been out there for an hour. What the fuck had they been doing for an hour? I don't know what Dave was doing. I was, you know, we were playing Paul. And all of a sudden he was making cup, make him a cup of tea so he can go back and sit back in the fucking studio. Anyway, as soon as it was done, um, I, I, well, as soon as I said it, I realised that I'd screwed up. I'd made a big mistake. And I just made to turn around and I just walked straight out of the studio. I walked down to the beach and I kept walking, just kept walking, walking, walking. And uh, I sort of sat on the beach with my head in my hands singing, that's it, fucked up again. You know, who knows how long I would have stayed with them if I hadn't opened my mouth and said that, that one big, big mistake. Mm. So, um, so yeah, that was, the, that was that. I mean, uh, I, uh, I sat on the beach and it was a, I was there for couple of hours and um, Warren pulled up in the car and he said oh, let's go come with me let's go back and get changed up we're all going out all right now I'm thinking uh, someone's about to say something but no one did not a dicky bird we got to the got to the club um, each night so we used to go to a club called the Waterloo oh. club in, in Nassau and um, we got back to the club and um, I walked in, the first person who met me was Nick, who lined up a bunch of uh, Snaps Chasers. So he gave me a beer, I've got Snaps Chasers, and he said, don't worry about it. Yeah. And uh, I apologise for being an idiot. And um, anyway, everything works out quite well that night. I, mean, I think that was one of the nights when they had a local band playing, and uh, Murray got up and did a, did a jam with them. And then I think Bruce got up and did a song with them. And, Turned out a really great night. So anyway, we um, we left left uh, fl- um, Nassau. We flew home for about a week. Enough time to sort of get your laundry done and then jump back on the plane and flew out to Fort Lauderdale. And within two weeks of being in Fort Lauderdale, Tony Wiggins again calls me into his room. Uh, sorry, Luke, we were going to have to let you go. And I went, well, that's ironic. He said, what's that? He said, I said to him, well, the last time I got fired by you, I said, I've been in America for a week. So this time I've made it. So this time I've made it for two weeks. And he went, well, there you go. He said, you want another six? Um, what's, what do you mean? He said, look, he said, you can either stay here on pay for another six weeks, but you're going to have to do what you're told. Or I could send you home unpaid now. And I went, ah, oh, fuck it. If you're going to pay me, I might as well stay. Because, you know, I've got nothing to go back for. Oh. Uh, and that's what happened. I stayed out for another six weeks, and that six weeks was was great. I, I felt kind of sort of numb that night. Um, I went out with uh, and had a few drinks with Bruce and uh, and his uh, young lady at the time. And uh, Dave, uh, Dave's wife was out there, uh, Tamar. Uh, we, uh, we went out and had a few drinks, and yeah, I did feel kind of numb but it, it sort of sunk in and the more I got used to the idea I was going over and they were going on yeah it's just one of those things I mean while we were there we went to uh, <coughs> we went to Disney World in Orlando and we were there for a few hours and then we went on to um, the uh, NASA Space Centre at, um, at Cape Canaveral Cape Kennedy 
uh, to see a shuttle launch, which didn't actually go because there was too much ice on the on the tubes. But um, <laughs> and fi I finally saw that that shuttle launch go. Um, I was back at the hotel in uh, Fort Lauderdale, and where I, I, my window was facing was north, and you could just see this little streak of smoke wow. going up in the sky. About, about two weeks later, yeah. Wow. So I did actually get get to see it, but it was tiny. Yeah, look, as I said, I mean, we could talk about the the power slave era just f forever. So, so maybe we could do that another time. Um, Steve, look, it's it, it's in an part e two. sorry in part. Two. Oh, we have to we have to do <laughs> we have to do a, just an episode on power slave. It's it is just so much more we could talk about. But um, Steve, how can our listeners get your book it is it is it is it is wonderful because it's actually one of the better iron maiden books out there that i've read so how how can how can the listeners get your book uh very simply they've got to go to um, libbyworld.co.uk and click on books and you know, there'll be a, a bit that says uh, buy it here now you click on that you get a drop down box you select your country easy as if you want the book person if you want the book personalized send an email to loopyworld1 at gmail gmail.com loopyworld1 at gmail.com send me a message there and i'll personalize the book for you brilliant and it is uh look it really is a terrific book <laughs> and it's a very unique book because as we said earlier in the interview it's written from the perspective of somebody that was there or that lived it and wrote the book as you went, you know, three and a half decades ago in the form of a diary. It is. Look at me this way. I've, I've sold <coughs> almost, well, I mean, just, just about 2,000 copies. And the only one, I'm not going to say bad review, because it's still got four stars out of five, but it was a review done by a guy who works for um, quite a well-known magazine. I won't mention any names. But he gave me a column 50 words it literally was 50 words and i could tell by looking through that that column that he hadn't read the book he'd flick through it but yeah. he hadn't read it 99.9.9 .9 recurring yeah i would and, say uh, have, have been good reviews yeah and and again the other thing i the other strength of your book is that it gives a lot of detail and insight and perspective about the early days of the band, which I guess a lot of a lot of people may not know, may not be aware of. And again, uh, you know, four four decades on, Iron Maiden has <coughs> very much a multi generational fan base, and yeah. a very very small minority lived through. You know, certainly the the nineteen seventy eight, seventy nine, eighty or eighty one. And then obviously there's my generation of fans who came on sort of around that number of the beast piece of mind era. And then you've got the next wave and so forth and so forth. Whereas this book really takes you back to where it all started and what was going on, the dynamics behind the, the key players in the band. So it's certainly a book that I sort of strongly recommend. One of the... Well, the thing is, I mean, basically, I could only write about what I knew. Correct. And once I, found, once I found the diaries and made that book sort of chrono chronologically correct, mm. you know, it, it's not like it's bullshit. You know, I didn't make any of it up. <laughs> exactly right. I, I didn't have to make it up. It's all written down in my diaries. That's it. So, Steve, what are, you, what are you doing now? What else are you doing now, uh, apart from being an international author? What, what else are you doing now? What are you up to? <laughs> international uh, celebrity, get me out of here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, right now, um, I'm uh, currently writing more columns for Metal Talk. Mm. Uh, I've just sent the second new one off, so um, I'm waiting for that to be published sometime in the next couple of days. Um, so if anybody wants, wants to sort of read that, go to metaltalk.net. Um, um, uh, they've, they've already published one, which talks about um, uh, getting back to... Uh, Getting back into the, in the fold, if you like, oh. you know, sort of going and catching up with a, a few people and you know, catching up with old friends. Um, 
And I do spend a bit of time making plastic models. I'm a bit of an aviation freak, so I've got myself an Air Force One, and I've been building that. Join the club. <laughs> yeah, leave yours in the box, Kaz. It's in the box. Um, Trust me, it's in the box. Yeah, yeah, I don't have the. I don't have the time of the. <laughs> I don't have the time of the patience to. Uh, to, yeah, to, to, to send do. send it to Paul Day. He'll do it for you. No, oh, he? oh, he actually lives an hour hour away from me. So yeah, I, I in Newcastle, um, yeah, I should I should do. Yeah. And um, uh, yeah, that's it for the moment. Uh, as for what the future holds, who knows? Uh, I'm off to see Maiden in uh, in New York in oh, July, yes. and yeah. I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Yes, well, I'll be catching yeah. up with you there. I'll be catching yeah, up with yeah. you there. Um, yeah, um, in uh, oh, not long, not long to go at all. Not long to go at all with that. I think, I think, Two the, months. yeah, I think, I think the the idea originally was to do this interview in New York, but then we thought, no. We just want to go to the pub and, and be social. Yeah. Be social. <laughs> so, look, <laughs> St- Steve. Look, this this has been absolutely awesome. Thank you so much for coming on this very first episode of the podcast. I do want to have you back, and um, maybe as as I said for the third time, we're really explore and get into the details of Power Slave because it's a very special album for all of us. But look. Thank you very much for joining us. It's been it's Thank been awesome. For having me. It's been awesome. Well, good luck. Good luck with the uh, podcast, guys. Thanks, mate. Thank you very much, sir. We'll chat soon. See you. In, see you in New York.